All right. So we're going to continue with our study to throughout the book of Thessalonians. We're in 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 3 this morning. Last week, I, I you know, was in closing out chapter number 2, I didn't realize how long that message uh, was going to run. So for those of you who were, you know, uh, uh, kind of maybe worn out by the time I was done with all the writing and the listening and the keeping your eyes open and all that good stuff, uh, I, you know, I don't really apologize, but uh, I know that you're glad that that's not the norm, that we go over an hour in a service, right? You shook your head yes, AJ. That, that's rude. <laughs> huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. You guys were in, that's right. They were in the nursery, and they had like six. That's, they had eight that screamed most of the morning. So, yeah, I, I bet they were glad that it was over. <laughs> oh. So I'm sorry I called you out, AJ. But anyway, uh, typically, no, we, we won't uh, try to, you know, speak at you for an hour and that type of thing. So this morning, maybe we can kind of, you know, dial that back a little bit. Because this message, you know, we're going to cover five verses this morning. It's really not that long. Um, <clears throat> this morning, Paul is going to uh, share his, well, one of his best mates in the ministry. I started to say best friends, and maybe he was his best friend, but definitely one of his best mates and um, someone that Paul had invested his life in and had saw this young man mature and to be the, become a, a missionary and have the same mindset as the Apostle Paul. And that's the title of the message this morning is uh, Timothy is going to go to uh, Thessalonica and go to the church there of the Thessalonians. So we'll be... Referring back a little bit to, you know, this time frame in, in Acts um, when Paul and Timothy uh, first came to Thessalonica, and we'll do a little bit of history here as uh, we're going to work our way through this passage. <coughs> so Timothy to the Thessalonians, chapter number 3, verses 1 through 5. Let's read there. Paul writes, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you and we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for our time together this morning in just lifting up your holy name in praising the God of the universe in praising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by allowing the Spirit of God that indwells us to Make our voices known unto you. Father, thank you. Truly blessed be your name. We thank you, Father, for giving us a place in your kingdom. Today, tomorrow, for all of eternity, being part of your family. Father, I pray for the family of God that's here this morning, that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive those things that come by your spirit. And Father, if by chance there's someone here this morning that's never trusted Jesus Christ, personally as their lord and savior i pray that today maybe the holy spirit would reveal that to them and help them acknowledge it and turn to you once again for all of eternity we love you we thank you and praise you in all this through christ our lord we pray amen so timothy to the thessalonians the key words this morning we're going to see paul's concern we're going to talk a little bit about paul's co-laborer and then the care that paul had as well and this is a very, uh, I'm going to say a tender passage, right? It's, it really shows the heart of the Apostle Paul. I think it really shows the heart that you and I ought to have as we minister to the world in which we live. Paul says, wherefore? So wherefore, what does that do? Well, that takes you back and ties you into just what's been spoken. So in order to get a good context, <clears throat> you would go back and refresh your memory regarding chapter number two. And the Apostle Paul there, <clears throat> he, 
he really spent some considerable time there talking about the family, the family relationship that existed between him and this church of the Thessalonians. First of all, we talked about how he came to, to the church as a tender, uh, caring, nursing mother, right? As a nursing mother and that, that tenderness that you have for that child. And you moms can relate to that more so than any of us uh, fathers can. <clears throat> but then he also talked to them and, and, and really gave them the charge from a father's perspective in wanting to, um, you know, set his child up for, for uh, success in the world, right? Dads, that, that's what we're called to do, right? We're called to uh, work with our wives and to train up our children in the way they should go and, and provide for them a, a good, solid foundation to jettison them at some point in time in their future when they stand alone. And then we get to sit back, hopefully, and we just get to enjoy that work that was put, you know. Uh, for me personally, I, I can say what a joy it is to, to look back and remember our daughters. Uh, and I don't say this to embarrass you, Selena, and, uh, and Carmen's in the, in the children's area, but just, you know, back in the day when they were going to school, and I used to just great at the money that I was spending for this, for the money I was spending for that. Or when they started going to high school, paying the extra money for the college credits, or then going to college and just, <laughs> but boy, what a blessing it is today. What a blessing it is today to look at my daughters and, and now my granddaughters and sons-in-law and to see where, they at, where they're at and that concern that I had for my children. And, you know, what a blessing. What a blessing it is when you see your children standing on their own doing their own thing. So you parents that have younger uh, children and, and, and wards, don't grow weary in well-doing. Stick with it, okay? Someday it, it will all come to, to uh, fruition and it will all be worth it as the old song goes, right? So um, mothers and fathers, we also saw how the Apostle Paul came alongside them and encouraged them as a brother, okay? Uh, uh, you know, in the family line, I'm the oldest of six kids, I wish I'd have done a better job as an older brother. I wish I would have uh, done a better job as, as being a brother that led my siblings properly. When I say properly, in the things of, of the Lord. I didn't, right? I played church. I went to church, you know, and, and I, I just kind of went through the motions. If I hadn't had the Bible then like I had now, it would have been a whole lot different circumstances. But today I pray for my brothers and sisters and I encourage them to, you know, hey, you know, the Lord's returning. It's not like they never went to church and they, they didn't hear some of the same things I heard, but it hasn't gotten a hold of them to this point. And I, I know this is, you know, we're videotaping, so maybe by God's grace they're going to watch this and they're going to see their brother talking to them today. And praise God, they know that I love them and, and they know that I want them to serve the Lord with however much time that we have left here on this earth. Amen? And that should be our goal. That concern that we have in a, in a family structure. And that's what we really saw in chapter number 2. So Paul comes to verse number 3, or chapter number 3, verse 1. He says, wherefore, with all that in the backdrop, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. When we could no longer forbear. He was suffering. He couldn't take it anymore. You know, the word salacious comes in here. And he was anxious about his new converts. He, he was just on pins and needles, and he, he just couldn't take it. And he said when he could no longer forbear, he had to send Timothy back to know how they're doing. We can go back to the book of Acts, chapter number 16, I think it is. Acts chapter number 17, I'm sorry. Acts chapter number 16 is when he picked up uh, young Timotheus. And in chapter number 17, Paul, you know, he went to Thessalonica there in verse number 1, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And ultimately, we know that the Jews believed not in verse number 5. They were moved with envy, and uh, basically they ran Paul out of, the, out of town. Along the way, they grabbed hold of Jason, who uh, was close to the, the synagogue, and I think they used Jason as, 
you know, um, as, um, oh, they held him hostage, so to speak. If you don't get out of town, if you don't stay out of town, this is what's going to happen to this guy. And I think that's really why Paul never went back. I think that's why Paul said he was hindered by Satan, because he knew what would happen to his friend and brother in Christ, one Jason, if he ever did go back there. So Paul leaves and he goes to Berea, and that didn't last well either. You see that there in verse number 10. He got ran out of town, and uh, uh, the, the, the Jews that had came to Thessalonica, then they went to Berea and ran him out there too. And we pick it up there in verse number 14. It said, And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought, brought him to, unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So I'm going to ho hold your finger right there in that place. And we, you know, we don't have a really good synopsis of the exact time frame, how all this un out played out. Okay, But we know that Paul, he was run out of Philippi. He ended up in Thessalonica. He ended up in Berea. And then he's going to go on and continue on south to Athens. And at some point in time, you know, Timothy and Silas, they came and met Paul, and they were all together there. And then at some point in time, when we get to chapter 3, verse 1, it says, When we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. Okay? So Paul suffered in his concern, and then his staying alone, we know that, you know, um, it did a mighty work for us because of what we have in Scripture, because of what Paul spent his time at Athens with. There's so much that we can learn there as we go out and we minister to the community and we minister to a world that doesn't know our Jesus. We pick it up there in verse number 16 of chapter 17 Acts. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Right. So he was stirred. He was literally provoked. He 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 really kind of got upset and, and uh, angry at all of the different gods that were there and, and all of the, the worship that was going on. The Bible tells us there that he came upon certain philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. You know, one said that the uh, the 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 feelings and, and all of life and the great feelings of life is the highest calling. Right. We ought to experience all that there is and just enjoy everything that there is. Well, the other side of the coin was, oh, no, we ought to put down all of those emotions and all those feelings and we ought to live an austere life. So Paul was up against both of those guys, both of those groups of people. And there's a, you know, there's a whole lot of, of information you can get out there if you'll go and look up the Epicureans and the Stoics. But the Bible tells us there that some of them wanted to hear what he had to say because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And the Bible says there in verse number 19 that they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, which is what we would call today the court or the hill of Ares, which is one of their gods. And they say, hey, we'd like to know this new doctrine whereof thou speakest of. And we understand that, you know, these people did nothing else than just to stand around and talk about something, whatever might come into their midst that was brand new. Something that they could just stand around and talk about and, and argue and discuss and, and banter back and forth. As you see there in verse number 21. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found to the al an altar to this un with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So we can see right there in, in Paul's little quick delivery here how he presents our God, our Savior, to this world who called him the unknown God, an unknown God, just in case they might have missed one to cover all their bases. 
You know, we may come against some people in our own culture today like that. You know, we live here in the Bible Belt, and, and for the most part, you know, people have uh, come up around uh, church and uh, churches on, you know, on any street corner. But, you know, w- w- our society has changed so much. There may be people out there who've never, you know, even visited a church or know anything about a church. They may have an idea of an unknown God. And here's a wonderful place that we can go and we can present God to the world if we would follow Paul's um, direction here. How does he meet them here? Well, he presents God as the creator. In verse number 24, he he presents God as the Lord. He presents God as life in verse number 25. And then he talks about purpose. As I'm standing here reading this passage this morning, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. What are we dealing with right now? Black lives matter. All lives matter. Blue lives matter. You know, we're, we're dealing with that in our culture today. And it's, around, it's spread around the world. But Paul dealt with it right here in the first century. He's made, God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And then he takes them right to their own um, poets. For in him, ye li- in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. He finishes off that little passage there by telling us, by telling them, by telling us, by telling the world that our God is knowable. He's not some far-off God, some far-off deity, some entity that is not knowable. He's very knowable. And there are people that come in contact with our lives. We're here that maybe people might know our God. Now, the Apostle Paul said here that he thought it good to be left alone. How many of you, now, don't just answer this, you know, Yeah, you just answer it however. I won't even set the stage. But how many of you really like being alone for extended periods of time? Okay, just imagine if you were always alone. How would you like that? Right, here's Paul. We see his heart. He had a heart for people. He loved people, and he had something to share. And he decides to go and set himself all alone in a strange country, a strange place, for the Thessalonians. That's really what he was doing. He just set himself apart and left his, <laughs> left his, as I said earlier, his probably his best confidant, his best help, sent them back to, Thessalonia, to the Thessalonians and he left himself alone. Paul walking the streets, dealing with all this idolatry and, and, and you know, not being able to minister. Obviously, God gives him an opportunity to be able to share his faith. And we know ultimately, if we'd go back and read the passage, the majority of him laughed in his face. They laughed in his face because of what he tried to present. Anybody ever laughed at you because of your belief in Christ? Anybody? Yeah, sure. If you've ever shared, if you've shared the gospel much, they probably laughed in your face. Oh, how can you believe that? Oh, that's just for weak people. Oh, I don't need to know that. I'm okay all on my own. Yada, yada, yada. Right? But Paul thought it was okay. He was concerned enough, he cared enough, that he left himself alone, and the Bible says there that he sent Timotheus, our brother, to them. Right? Now, as I'm I'm looking at that, you know, you talk about love, and Paul shared love in the previous chapter. Mother, father, brother. What do we think of love? Is it just an emotion? Love has action, doesn't it? 
And that's what we see here, this agape love. This is that love in action we talk about many times as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Agape, charity, love in action. That's what we see here with the Apostle Paul. That's the concern. That was his heart as he reached out to the Thessalonians. So let's go on to verse number 2. Because it says there that he sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So here Paul had spent, I think it was three Sabbath days as uh, he, he was run out of town fairly quickly. If I go back to Acts and chapter number 17, I think it was three Sabbath days. So uh, Paul was there three to four weeks, right? If you look at that timeline. So he really gave them a, a, a lot of information as we're going to find out as we continue through the book of First and Second Thessalonians. Paul really, he, he heaped it on in that period of time. They really spent some time with the Apostle Paul. I don't imagine it was just coming together on Sunday mornings for worship. You know, I think they had some extended time of, of preaching and teaching and <clears throat> exposing all that he could regarding the faith. But Paul says that they sent Timotheus, our brother. So we talk about our brother. That's a brother in Christ, you know, and, and I've talked about it before. Uh, the brethren, you know, this is our family. This is our, this is our family, church family, local. You know, we, have a church, we have a church family universal, right? All the saints, all the saints. I mentioned to you, um, you know, last week that our, our brothers and sisters down in Harrisonville, They've got their Bible conference this week, and they're going to be putting together the Word of God. And I, I hope that some of you can go down there and spend a couple of hours a day, whatever it is that you could commit to go down and help uh, Brother Brian Hedges and, and um, uh, the church down there, and uh, just, just laboring together and, and rubbing elbows with the brothers. But Paul called Timothy a brother, brother in Christ, not just a brother, but also a minister. He called him a minister of God. Now, the word behind, the Greek word behind minister here is the same word that we would use as deacon. All right. So deacons, you're you're a minister of God. Deacons, you know that you are a servant. Right. So I hope that you are, are, are seeking ways that you can minister to your body, the body of believers, you know. We can make a phone call. You haven't seen somebody for a while. You pick up the phone and you make a call and say, hey, we haven't seen you. Just wanted to know we care about you. We missed you. You know, that's ministry. That is uh, showing concern and care. A minister of God. There's no higher calling. Can you think about that? There's no higher calling than being a, min being a minister of God. Right? Mike Adams filled in this morning and, and he uh, covered for Dan this morning. And uh, did a marvelous job in, in what the Word of God has been doing in his own life there from the book of Psalms and just how it has Im impacted him. And it's kind of shaken him up a little bit, right? And he was not afraid to share that with his brothers and sisters in Christ as he was serving this local church. So um, praise God for that. But Paul says that he sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. Now, we had, you know, quite a bit of discussion regarding gospel and the gospel and gospels, you know, so I'm not going to go back and, and refresh or rehearse that. But Paul said that he was a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And, you know, the, the title of, or the uh, subheading here on this port is a co-laborer. He's a fellow laborer, right? He came alongside to labor together with the Apostle Paul in ministering to this new church. And we can see that Paul's heart for this new church, you know, they, they just got established and they've been there, you know, for three or four weeks with him. And, you know, he sent Timothy back to him. Hey, go check them out and go see how they're doing. And, and uh, if they got questions, maybe you can answer it and things like that. And I'm thinking of, you know, that passage and I'm thinking about what Paul was in his heart in regards to my own heart and, and, and for ministry here in, in our local church. You know, we don't have a new church here. We've got an established church. We have established members, right? For the most part, we, we have been uh, in the body of Christ for uh, more years than not, okay? So it's not like that, you know, we have a brand new fledgling church that, that needs a, 
a whole lot of uh, stroking and nurturing and things like that. But even in that, you know, I hope you know that, you know, it is a labor of love. It is a, uh, not something we do just because uh, we feel like we have to. And I, when I say we, I'm talking primarily about the, the, the three ordained quote unquote pastors. That's not to say the deacons, this wouldn't apply to you. That's not to say the women that come alongside and work with us and, and some of you that are working on other aspects of ministry. But fellow laborers, we're all working together. And we do it because of the love that we have of the body, right? It is all about being a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. The gospel, the good news, the good news of Christ. Don't we want to share that good news? I hope you want to share the good news of Christ. People are, are dying and on their way to hell. And they need the gospel. They need some good news. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for them. He paid the price for their sins. He was buried. And he rose again after three days according to the scriptures. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verses 1 through 4. That's our gospel. The gospel of Christ. Let's be fellow laborers with the apostle Paul, with Timothy, with Silas, with the saints that have gone before us, that people might know Jesus Christ in a personal way. Before it's too late. I've told you before, I believe that Jesus Christ's return is right around the corner. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Number one, we have to ask ourselves, are we ready? And then number two, we need to ask ourselves, how many people around us that we love and we know very dearly, are, how many of us would say they're ready? And are we doing anything to bridge that gap, that difference? Because there's going to come a day very soon when there'll be no more time. So let's make sure we're fellow laborers. Now, Paul says that Timothy was a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. And specifically, he sent him back to the Thessalonians to establish them. First one, the first key word here is to establish them. Now that word establish, you know, we understand, make fast, right? Not, not run fast, but make fast, to secure it, right? To set it fast, to uh, fix firmly. That's what is being talked about here when Paul says to establish their faith. He didn't want the, the faith to come and go, right? The Bible talks about that the, the work of the ministry is there that we wouldn't be carried away with every slight of doctrine. Amen? That's what we're called to minister uh, through the body of Christ for. But Paul <clears throat> uses this word here to establish them. And there's a, there's a good word in the Old Testament if you follow the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And if you'll turn to the book of Exodus, chapter number 17, there's a, there's a real good um, play on words here that we can apply to ourselves and whenever we talk about establishing in this case to establish the believers of Thessalonica to establish ourselves as we reach out and try to establish others so if you would look at Exodus chapter number 17 and I'm going to start reading in verse number 8 <clears throat> so here we are um, the nation of Israel, this is the exodus, so they're out and about, right? They're not still uh, tied down in Egypt, but they're out and about. And they're coming into some battles, aren't they? They're coming into some, some uh, issues with the people around them. The Bible says there in verse number 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek, Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. 
And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. We get the picture? We've all seen that. We've all, we've all read that passage, right? Moses and Aaron and Hur on the top of a mountain. And as Moses is interceding, and Mike, I found this interesting this morning that your, your message is on prayer. And here's a key point of this message on prayer. As Moses would lift up his hand and intercede for the nation of Israel, he's praying for them. He's praying. Is prayer always easy? It's not, is it? Prayer's not easy. How many times are you sitting there praying for something and all of a sudden you're going, anybody ever have that happen to them? Oh, good. I'm hoping it was just, wasn't just me, right? No, prayer's not easy. There's a battle being waged. When you go to the Lord in prayer, there's a battle being waged, even as we see here with Moses and Aaron and her. And as the hands were up and he's making interce- intercession, Joshua's having success. When his hands get tired, they suffer. So what happens? These two old boys come and they prop up his hands. Amen? They prop up his hands and they help him stay engaged. Now, this is interesting. I thought it was interesting. We have Moses. Moses is a prophet of God. We have a priest. Aaron is a priest of God. And we have a prince. Her is the son of Caleb, and he is one of the princes of Israel. All anointed ministers, they were there to guarantee Israel's victory. Well, I would ask you this. Do we know of a certain prophet, priest, and king that guarantees victory for us? Amen. We have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who is seated even now at the right hand of God the Father in that position of authority on high, making intercession for us. This Old Testament established. They, he was fixed firmly. He was stood. He was solid. And they, they held up. You and I, we are solid when we're in Christ. Amen. We are solid when we're in Christ. We just got to remember that. We can be established. Just like uh, Timothy was going back to establish these Thessalonians, you and I can be established. We can be made fast when we look to our prophet, our priest, and our king, the Lord Jesus Christ. He also says that (coughs) he sent Timothy, a fellow laborer, to establish and also to comfort them concerning your faith and to comfort you concerning your faith. So Timothy is coming alongside them, right? He's coming alongside them to encourage them, to appeal to them. What do do we have in our church that we allow our people to do that with others with? It's called discipleship. We use a discipleship tool right our directions directions one and then our discipleship to two <coughs> material they're for your comfort they're to establish you and to bring comfort in your walk in christ we'll come right alongside of you we'll be an encouragement to you we'll establish what's the four goals of discipleship right here's a good place for those Four goals of discipleship. To establish the disciple in the Word of God. To establish the disciple in the fellowship of believers. To establish the disciple in the structure of the local New Testament church. And to establish the disciple in the work of the ministry. Sounds like a good good formula to me. So let's make sure we're all discipled, amen? Amen. Let's make sure that you're using the tools that God has blessed you with. 
so that you could find comfort in your walk in Christ. When you go through those trials so that you have a body of believers that can come right alongside of you and bring comfort. Maybe a specific uh, a minister, right? Some, an, a specific minister to somebody to come alongside you and serve you, right? To help you through some trials, whatever they might be, because that's what they're doing here with this church at Thessalonica. Bring in this young man, Timothy, to comfort them concerning the faith. Because they were going through some things. They were going through some things because Paul says there in verse number three that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we were appointed thereunto. Persecution, afflictions, they're going through it. And the apostle Paul says, you know what, you got some persecution, you got some afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Paul did not go to Thessalonica preaching a weak gospel. He did not go there and, and blow smoke at these new believers and tell them, Oh, if you'll just believe Jesus, everything will be great. Everything will be fine. He'll take care of everything for you. Paul told them that they were going to suffer some persecution. Now, Peter was one. Peter... He knew about persecution. We see that as Peter writes his first letter. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter number 4, verses 12 and 13, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be repro reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part He is evil spoken of, but on your part He is glorified. So Peter knew about some afflictions, and he wrote that in his letter to the twelve tribes that were scattered abroad. You and I, we shouldn't be unawares of persecution is going to come. We see it right here in this letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. We shouldn't be moved by these afflictions. We need to be established. Amen? We need to be set firm in Christ, continuing to allow our high priest to sustain us. He says, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. So maybe that's why they were able to withstand the persecution that's coming against them. You know, there's a passage in Corinthians, and I didn't write it down. I forgot it, quite frankly. There's a passage in, Corin in, Cor in 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul says, like five, six years later, he's still commending the churches of Macedonia, which is, this is one of them, about their, you know, their liber liberality and their giving heart and their, their uh, being able to sustain itself through all the trials and the tribulations. Paul could commend them many years later, because they made it through. Maybe they were able to make it through because Paul had forewarned them. Maybe he had predicted for them and, and they knew what was coming, so it wasn't a big shock to them. Just think about our culture today. I'm talking about our, our church culture. You know, we've already talked about, should we think it's strange that the church has to go through something like COVID-19? We've already talked about as we draw closer to the Lord's return that the birth pangs are going to get stronger and stronger. So it really shouldn't be a surprise if the church is asked to go through a little bit of trial and tribulation. And I would present to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's going to get a lot worse. As we draw closer to the time of the Lord's return, return we're going to see more and more. So make sure that you are established. Make sure that as we have forewarned you about persecution and, and predicted some of these afflictions are going to come our way, just remember that. So when they do come, 
Oh, yeah, He's, we've been told this was going to happen more and more. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised and caught off guard. Just think of the churches that are not taught this. Just think of those who all they ever hear is the prosperity gospel. All they ever hear is the name it and claim it. Where they're riding on the coattails of all their emotions. The highs and lows of emotions. Not being established on the firm foundation of the truth of the word of God. They're going to get knocked off their feet. You know, the Bible talks about a falling away before that man of sin is revealed. I don't know exactly what that falling away is, but maybe it has something to do with persecution that will come in the, in the, in the latter days. I don't know. But we shouldn't think that we would miss some affliction and persecution if the first century church didn't. Amen? Amen. Paul says, for this cause, now he's going to go back and he's going to Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't look at 1 Timothy 3.12. Let's, let's do that. 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 12. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's a great verse but I don't think it necessarily applies to this prediction. So I'm going to go look at 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse... Oh, yeah, there it is. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 12. What's it say there? Oh, that makes much more sense, doesn't it? Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Makes great sense, doesn't it? When we see what Paul told young Timothy several years later, as Paul's time on this earth is just about up. He knew his time was just about done. We shouldn't be surprised by it, ladies and gentlemen. Paul told this church about it, therefore he's telling you and I about it. Amen? This is a New Testament epistle. It has relevance to you and I right now. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, there's that word forbear again, Paul's patience his had run out. His anxiety had gotten the best of him. And he had to do something about it. He just couldn't sit by idly anymore. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. The Apostle Paul knew who he was up against. The Apostle Paul knew his enemy. And God is, is very gracious in that He does not hide our enemy from us. He tells us everything we need to know about our adversary, the devil. We just have to take the time and invest in the Word of God so that we understand it. So that we're not surprised when He comes with temptation in our own life. Because we all know that the, 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 the devil, as a roaring lion, right, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We have a tempter. They had a tempter. We have a tempter. Their temptation, probably not the same as our temptation. My temptation is not the same as your temptation, which isn't the same as your temptation. But I guarantee you, we all have one. We all have something where Satan likes to get in there and work in our lives. How do we combat it? We combat it with the Word of God. Amen? Because the Bible tells me that greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. The one that I feed the most is the one that's going to control me. You know the principles. You, and if you don't, let's talk. Let's have some counseling. Let's talk about what you're dealing with so that you can get over it. And you can walk in the power of the Spirit and not the lust of the flesh. Amen? Because you've got a tempter. I've got a tempter. They had a tempter. Paul said he could not forbear. I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain.
You know, the Lord Jesus Christ was fully aware of this tempter. Back in Matthew chapter number 4 and verse number 3. Let's, let's look at verse number 1 first. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Devil in verse number 1. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger, hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. I don't think there's any doubt that this tempter is equal to the devil. Can I get an amen? Do you all have a tempter? Yeah. What's his name? It's the devil. He's our adversary. He may have lost your soul. And if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he's lost your soul forever. But he wants to tempt you. He wants to make you think that you're unworthy. He wants to drag you down to his level, so to speak. He wants to use everything in this world to cause you to not have a testimony, to not have a witness, to make you think you're not worthy to even be able to go and share the gospel. He wants to take your feet right out from under you. And he's had thousands of years, thousands of years to perfect, to perfect his craft. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 5. For you husbands and wives out there, this is, this is what's being spoken to. The Apostle Paul encourages those in marriage that they wouldn't defraud each other because there's this being out there that wants to tempt them and his name is Satan defraud ye not one the other except it be for consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency Satan and tempting they go together 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 3 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. Paul says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is, that is in Christ. Don't make it difficult, ladies and gentlemen. You see what Paul says? The simplicity that is in Christ. Give not place to the adversary. Don't give him sway in your life. We're talking about temptation here. We're talking about the care that Paul had for the church at Thessalonica. The same care that I, as your pastor, and the other pastors on staff have for you as well. The same care that we have for you. We want you to not be swayed by the tempter. Not to be beguiled by our adversary, the devil. We believe that we have the tools necessary to combat that. Me personally, I can stand here and say it because I know how he's delivered me from things in my own personal life. And I know that if he can do it for me when there's nothing special about me, he can do it for you too. But many times, unfortunately, we want to stay in the shadows, we want to stay in the darkness. Well, I can't let people know about this problem or about that problem because they'll think less of me. You need to get over yourself. You need to get over yourself and ask for help if you need it. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with alcohol? Get help. It's available. Are you dealing with pornography? Deal with it. Get over it. There is a way out of it, but you have to desire it and ask God to come alongside you and to establish you. 
You got problem with gossip? You can't quit talking about people? It's just the biggest sin as anything else. You got a problem with murmuring? You know, I'm not. I'm not saying any of this because I know anything. I'm saying this because we're a church of human beings, amen. And human beings have issues, and we got to deal with them from time to time. Deal with it. Don't keep living. We sang that song, uh, "Redeemed." The chains. I've been set free. Don't put yourself back in bondage to anything. Christ set you free when you asked Him to be your Lord and Savior. He set you free. Don't allow your adversary, don't allow this tempter, don't allow this persecutor to put you back in bondage. He's powerful, but He's not all powerful. Amen? He's powerful. But he's not all powerful. My God, my Savior, my Counselor, the Holy Spirit, he's much stronger than that old devil. But I have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. May we make the right choices according to God's words. Amen? Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for a a little message here from the Apostle Paul, but it has such ramifications for our own lives and our own culture today, right where we live. Father, I pray for anybody that may be dealing with anything, anything, anything from the tempter. Anything is keeping them and hindering them from being all that they can be for you. And remembering that they have been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been set free from the laws of sin and death. Help them, Father, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. To continue to put you first in their lives. That you'd be glorified in everything they say and everything that they do. Father, thank you for our time together. We thank you for this, our local church. We ask a continued blessing on this body of believers even as we're part of the, the, the great body, the universal body, the church, the bride of Christ. Thank you, Father. May your will be done today and every day. Help us look to you for our guidance and direction. Now, before I say amen, before we continue on and we prepare to, to depart today, if something's been said to you specifically today and, and you would say, that God has spoken to a need in your life, that you need Jesus Christ personally. Would you just lift up a hand so I can pray for you? Not to embarrass you, not to call you out. I won't do that. But this is between you and the Lord. God, I need you. I need you as my Savior. Is that anybody? Anybody here? Dear Lord Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. Today, I want to make it personal. Well, if by chance we're all believers here today, maybe God has spoken to a need in your life. Maybe you have been giving in to the temptation, some temptation that our adversary, our our tempter, our adversary, the devil, has been thrown in our path. And today, God has called you to rise above that by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that you this morning? Amen? Amen? Thank you. Father, thank you for working in our hearts. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that brings that conviction. Father, help us to use this as a springboard to draw ourselves closer to you in spirit and in truth. Help us to use the Word of God to combat the effects of our adversary this tempter, the one known as the devil. Father, we have the assurance from your word that you're greater than he is. And if we'll come alongside you and be established through the word of God, 
by prayer, by seeking your face, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we can have that victory. And we ask continued guidance and direction in all that we say and all that we do. We love you. We thank you. We praise you for all of this in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Amen. Amen. So. Uh-oh.